Linux OTC. Welcome to episode 30. I'm Bill. I'm Eric. I'm Majid. I'm Leo. And I'm Popey. Popey. We made it, guys. Hello. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Linux don't... OTC. Yeah, Bill's going to go all fangirly again. Oh, again? Oh. You've been on like four shows in the past couple of weeks with this guy, I'm pretty sure. I know, but he still gets fangirly about the whole thing. Oh, okay. If you would have, if you would have, gosh, if you'd have told me that I'd be hanging out with the likes of you guys. <laughs> if you told five, me that five, one day ago, in the future, uh, I would be there with Pulpy. You guys are making <laughs> fun of me. Well, I do declare. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh! Okay, all right. All right. Yeah. We better we better get some Linux in yeah, here. Yeah, so so For those so, so, of so you not watching the video. Bill is now blushing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a what's lot. that oh, red thing over there? Yeah, that's I didn't know you could get that red. <laughs> neck. That's another tight levy sex tape. All right. Um, as I Ooh. Anywho, uh, yeah. we uh, we were talking before you guys joined us about. And it's it's yeah it's actually quite good actually that Poppy's on here because we've all gone Ubuntu, haven't we? Me and Bill have anyway. Yeah. yeah. And according to your distro hopper, so have you, Eric? Well, no, I tested it, and I still have it on my uh, my tablet PC. But, but I'm that went using... straight to the garbage. Well, technically, I'm on Ubuntu because I'm using Pop OS, which is still okay. 2004. Okay. Well, I'm using and the 20, Cinnamon because I yeah. I wanted that new kernel so that I could have the first class support for my Focusrite devices. And, oh yeah, and it's uh, it's it's fine. Um, I went with the cinnamon edition just to not break my workflow so much. Um, I've had about five incidents where it just refused to post for some reason, and so, I don't know what so, that's all about. Yeah. So this uh, this uh, Arch install that I had, um, Endeavor OS, I've got rid of that, and now I'm on Ubuntu Unity. Oh, good thing I made that video then. It is, yeah. yeah. That's funny when you pinged me. Bit of a veer the... there off the path. Unity, okay. When, and how are when you enjoying you Unity there, me. Majid? Sorry. Sorry, sorry, Poppy, what did you say? Sorry. Now, uh, how am I enjoying Unity? Uh, well, it's the first time I'm using it in God knows how many years. It's going to be about five, six years at least. What was it, 2018? They killed 1804, wasn't it? Uh, Gnome became the default? Yeah. Was it 1604? That was the first LTS that it became yeah. the mm -hmm. default, yeah. Yeah, so um, it's it's good. It's fast. It works well. Um, it doesn't break. But then I don't know if that's an Ubuntu thing rather than a Unity thing. No, that's just the you haven't used it long enough thing. Okay, fair point. Um, I've never had a problem with it. Uh, <laughs> Ubuntu or Unity, though? Hey! hey. hey. Ooh, wait. Yeah, but that's classic Unity. Look at that glassy effect. That's the old one. Yeah. This is 1404. I yeah, just upgraded it is. this laptop from 1204 to 1404. Whoa. I did wow. it just before we started Wait, recording. Are the repos still <laughs> available to do that? Of course they are. Yes. Wow. Because yes. it's oh, extended yeah, that's support, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. It's just yeah, barely 10 years now. I went into a... Wow. I've got a customer that uh, in order to... Well, it's a steel mill. In order to go in there, you've got to take... you got to watch... Uh, a video, a safety video, and then you got to take a little quiz. And Don't you do breathe all that. the metal. You do all that on a Ubuntu machine running Unity, and huh. um, which is kind of odd for a place like that in the United States. No, it's not. But you uh, don't have to touch it ever. You know, I <laughs> I did a Control Alt uh, Control Alt T, and then did a quick U name. Uh, to see what version it was and all that and it was 1604 so I, oh you guys must have the uh uh ubuntu pro or <laughs> whatever the extended oh, they, they you didn't. should have seen them look straight through me like what is that <laughs> support are you yeah. kidding me this is 804 yeah. so, <laughs> what's that been, there ubuntu fang yeah. i'm i'm willing to bet it it had it hadn't been updated in probably 10 years it's probably not even connected to a network, is it? It's probably just like uh, a local video, isn't it? Well, that's a good question, actually. It probably it's isn't. just so. stored on a flash drive hanging off the back. That's it. Because yeah. it, cool. it is an HTML document that uh, they do the uh, test on, but I don't know if that goes anywhere or 
or what, and then they print you up a silly little ID card. Yeah, it's because they didn't know how to how to install VLC, and they were like, well, I can just do this in JavaScript. So they, they did it in Firefox instead. I think they just had somebody that said, hey, this will work, and it's free. Yeah, probably. Just that magic word, free. Yeah. 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 I, 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 remember, I remember donating a laptop once to a charity it was I mean, obviously they would, but they were a bit iffy about taking it because they weren't sure if they could sell it. And I was like, no, you can use it, you know, for the admin stuff. And they're like, oh yeah, actually that would come in handy. But I had to kind of keep make it, it ran Mint, and I had to make it look as much like Windows as possible. Oh, you tricked them. them. Take, I didn't. I, I did tell them it wasn't Windows, but I made it function like. Yeah, Windows. but they didn't know what Windows was, so you tricked them. No. <laughs> what's what's well, I mean, but but it was anyway they were going to take it. It is weird seeing like things you recognize in like incongruous places. Yeah. I was, uh, I was buying a table many years ago before I got into Linux. I used to be an SAP consultant and um, the, the shop that I bought, we were buying, me and my wife were buying a table and chairs for our dining room. And the shop that we were in, she said, oh, have you ever bought anything from us before? And I said, no. And she said, oh, come over here and I'll sign you up on our system and then we can get a delivery booked and all that kind of stuff. I was like, okay, I sit down. And she opens this little door in a cupboard and there's a tiny, tiny display. It's like 10 inch, if that. And she had the resolution of like 640 by 480 and she was moving oh. all these scroll bars around to try and navigate around the interface. And I just nudged my wife and said, and because I, I recognized the UI, and I went, that's SAP. And her ears pricked up, this woman. Yeah. And she turned around and she went, do you know what this is? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I work on that. And she said, oh, I'll keep hold of your name and uh, phone number because if I get any problems, I'll give you a call. <laughs> yep. Definitely. Yep. I don't want to buy a, tra a table anymore. You We're know, leaving. walk no, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, can't, you can't give me this table now for free. Yes, I'm yes. off. Goodbye. <laughs> Well, I mean, with this, gosh, I thought I was going to have trouble with the snaps, but I, I don't know what the hubbub's about. It was just. It as is fast. older software, though. Well, I mean, the, that, I mean, so I know. I'm talking about works. like Firefox. It just yeah. it opens right. It no. works. It's they've fine. been because, they've been pretty good for the past couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Well, because because I got Ubuntu Cinnamon on my laptop in it, like I mentioned at, um, on Mincast and. Um, you know, I ended up then installing GNOME desktop on it, which then gave me a vanilla GNOME experience rather than the Ubuntu GNOME, which is quite kind of cool, actually. I quite like it. Um, but uh, whenever I was, I, the snaps that I was going for were like last updated 2021, last updated 2023. Yeah. Yep. And I was kind of like, because mm, I, I did try to just stay in the snap ecosystem as App much as install possible. Flat pack. Unfortunately, yeah, I had to do that after a bit. Yeah. yeah. Just, but uh, I did try. It's not performance. It's not performance. You don't have to say nice things about snaps just because I'm here, right? You can, oh, no, no, no. If you like, I don't, I don't no, want to. No. Because of all the no, people actually, on this feed, only one of us has written a script to get rid of the snaps. They've actually done a really good job of making it just a few things now. One is don't customize your cursor theme. <laughs> Because that. Oh yeah, I noticed cursors. that the other day. I have because I yeah. installed the VLC snap, and then I realized that the other day when I was watching uh, rewatching True Detective, the first season, and I was like, "Why has my cursor gone like this?" And then I remembered you, Eric, mentioning this. Yeah. And then the other thing, like you said, Majid, some of the th snaps that I was using were out of date, and so it's just a you know maintenance and packaging kind of thing, which I understand that's volunteer effort, and you know is not. Uh, I hate to be thank you know, I don't want to jump on people for not maintaining it, but I feel like if you're going to add it, then at least try to maintain it. And yeah, know, but they did and, for the first six months. Right. It's tricky. <laughs> it is tricky because it, it is a burden when like, and this is not a snap specific thing. It is a burden to package someone else's software. Like Absolutely. If, if it's your own software that you've written, you're motivated to package it, and you're motivated maybe to package it. Like you look mm. at something like Quick Emu that Martin does, right? He puts out a new release, and he's got all automated scripts that spit out all the different types of packages, and someone else might package it for some in some other way, but he, you know, he doesn't really care about that. Like I've got snaps that I look at the graph of like how many people are using it, and it's like you know. One of them is like 800,000 people, something like that, right? And that's over a period of five years. The graph is goes beyond five years. I can't see back any further than five years. So I know I've been maintaining that thing and putting out new packages for, for 
like a quite a long time mm. in in you know it's it's longer than I've done anything else you know clubs or community contribution in any mm. way like you know there's nothing else that I've contributed time to as much as that but it is a mill around your neck like if you yep. if you this is all the, 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 this is a this is a, uh, a a free and open source problem in general isn't it it's you know it's it's endemic to the whole community in a sense because it's a community effort and you know life happens you know and you know it's it's hard enough hard enough work to do it in your spare time as it is and then yeah stuff happens people have got stuff to do people have jobs people have families you know you can't expect to do you know you scratch your own itch right i mean you either are trying to you know you were doing it because you wanted to add snaps to a new thing which was the snap store and um, and were probably snapping things that were interesting to you or that you were using. And that's the same thing with the AUR. You find the same problem where, you know, yes, it'll be there, but the person who originally added it or is maintaining it maybe now isn't interested in doing that anymore. And if someone else right. doesn't pick it up, then, okay, you've got abandoned software. So. But the, the diff... The, hmm. So I'll, get, I'll play devil's advocate for you. The the way that snaps are architected and the way that the AUR is architected is not as good as the way that the Ubuntu and Debian archive is architected and the way FlatHub is architected. Because with FlatHub, it's one giant repo, uh, one org, and literally anyone could do a pull request to update a flat pack. If, if they're in the FlatHub GitHub organization, if you go to github.com slash FlatHub, and there's a separate repository for every single application that's published in FlatHub. There's thousands in there, right? And if you happen to notice one day that something's out of date and they and they happen not have to implemented some automation to update it automatically, then you could log into GitHub, go in and edit a couple of files and update it as a pull request. You could do that. But with Snapcraft, because individuals have responsibility for packages or organizations have responsibility for packages and it's somewhat more opaque where the software is coming from and it's not directly immediately obvious where the source code is it's not as straightforward as someone just going oh i'll update that and put a couple of change a couple of numbers you know the version number and a you know a a checksum and that's that's it it's not as easy and and equally with the ubuntu and the debian archives those archives are maintained by a community like any of the any of the packages in like VLC in the Ubuntu archive or like lib Python, like anyone could update those things. And I think the way that AUR and Snapcraft are architected doesn't lend itself as well to community contribution to that kind of stuff, which is a flaw in the plan. Yeah, you do have in the AUR you do have the ability to mark a package as being outdated and then mm-hmm. that developer will get an email notifying them so there is that is it possible sure. that it's a lot of the reason it works that way at least from canonical's point of view is that they they're kind of they're kind of putting together a consumer product for the enterprise and you need to own it or you need to be able to say that these yeah, yeah, people this is my have theory. the yeah. ownness of these individual packages I, instead I think, of just letting the community deal with it. I think it. it was envisaged that the author of a piece of software would package that piece of software. Right. That, and it, yeah. it tries to encourage you, like Firefox main, uh, Mozilla maintained the Firefox Snap, for example. It, that makes sense they are an organization they are responsible for the software and they're responsible for the packaging that makes sense but not everyone wants to learn how to package software and so you're always going to get a community of people who are packaging stuff on behalf of someone else like you know the classic example is x screensaver right it's written by jamie zawinski and he publishes the source code and it's on his website and the debian packages take that source code package it up and put it in debian and he gets really grumpy because he gets bug reports from people running x screensaver on debian stable which is like two three four five years old and because his email address is in the package (laughs) people email him directly and it's not his fault because the latest version is on his website and so that this is not a new thing this whole you know friction between the people who make the software and the people who package the software and the people who deliver the software this is this is an old story, as old as software, you know, has ever been, and 
unfortunately, this is just the latest iteration of this same problem, and it's not solved. Flatpak have solved it in a better way than Snap did, I think, but for community contributions. But um, and I don't know if Canonical will will ever fix this. I I don't know how they could straightforward. Well, we solved it years and years and years ago. Just publish the tarball. And let other people take it, and then don't ever put my email address. Right, in. and then nobody will use it. <laughs> and then that—that's where you end up with just bearded nerds like us using the software. Exactly, and, no and the way right. it should be. Yeah, right. yeah. Hello, Steam Deck. You know, yeah, you would never get right. things like Steam Deck and you know System Seventy Six and Dell shipping devices if that was. The oh, case. I know. So, yeah, yeah. From an end user perspective, someone who is not much of a developer, I think Flatpak has been sort of a revelation for me in the way that I use my system and it really has freed me up to try any number of different distros that might have been a challenge previously because really you know the distro is giving you the kernel and some of the core of the system but you know I don't have to care if their repo has the most up-to-date software because I can just right. get the thing I need yeah might as well might as well make a, a, a you know, I'm dead against people making new Linux distros, but someone should make one that just has no applications in it at all, and it just points to FlatHub, and that's it. Like, it just has the kernel, and it just has Flatpak, the command line utility. Oh, I'm sure that exists. That point upwards. I'm sure that exists. Definitely run Arch that way. That's dangerously close to the Atomics, man. I, I was going like. to say, Atomic, yeah. you know, the Flatpak has really enabled that to be a thing. Yeah, that's that's yeah. my new thing, man. Like, I don't I don't ever think about it. It's, it's scary. Well, how much I don't think about the OS anymore. We, we was atomic, and now it's is it configurable or is it no uh, a, composable? Com is the composable. latest. Well, that's George's word though. Ah, so I mean, I was gonna say I can hear George Castro screaming yeah. from the distance. Yeah, that's that's George's word. We had him uh, we had him on a live stream for a little while, and that was that was enlightening. But yeah, I, mean, I saw I saw I jumped on the uh, watching the live stream. Yeah, oh, uh, that's right. Yeah, you were there. It was like two in the morning or something here, and I was like, oh, hello, George is online. Oh, <laughs> yeah. he's on a live stream. Oh, I know what he's going to say. <laughs> yeah, so that that's his word. But I mean, I think uh, Fedora has uh, circled the wagons around Atomics, which I don't know. I don't think there's a good word to describe it because people that don't know what that kind of system is aren't going to know it, no matter what word you call it. But yeah. but it is. Uh, I I just call it like Android. Like iOS, mm -hmm. because yeah. yeah, you can you can argue about the details, but I think people might understand that a little bit better. Uh, it's like your phone, so uh, but it really is because I don't I don't ever think about it. I, sometimes I'll do an RPM OS whatever I don't even remember the command. It's in the history somewhere. I'll do that sometimes and just keep using my laptop like I normally would. So is that uh, your day? Is that your daily now, Leo? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's this one. Uh, my framework, Aurora, is what I use right now. Yep, and it's been I've what's, I've had it on there Aurora? for two months. Uh, Aurora that... is so there's Fedora Atomic, which is the Kinoite, the KDE one. Uh, Aurora is George's team's uh, like spin on it, which is they call it Ubuntuized Fedora because it has all the codecs, it has all the things. I installed it, I could immediately use it. I didn't have to add in like uh, RPM Fusion or anything like that to get FFmpeg libs so that I could watch my videos. Um, so it was, and Ooh, it was is just- is it the past? Is that still the Right, past? yeah. The, the, mm. See, I ended up on Linux Mint for this reason, and now I am on Aurora for this reason. Yeah, Aurora, 20, 20 years later. Which, which desktop is Aurora? KDE, Plasma. Okay, because Bluefin is their Good no one. one yeah yeah yep. okay. i love the fact I that it's called bluefin that does make me chuckle okay there's there's is there a backstory to that what is that it's the name of the building that canonical was in uh, up uh. until covid <laughs> and uh. they left that building yeah there was the 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 original building that canonical was in um was a, a tower and canonical had one floor of that tower i can't remember the name of it millbank um, okay so millbank tower uh is on the north coast of the Thames in London and mm -hmm. it's quite tall and they moved out of that building on the same day as the Queen's Jubilee and there was a flotilla of boats going by and it oh, was her birthday or something. Yeah, 2022. Like, uh, no, longer ago than that. Um, oh, the, oh, that that Jubilee back in 2002. That yeah, one. the one when she was alive, yes. Well, of uh, course she was alive <laughs> in 2022 as well. <laughs> Just... Um, but yeah, that, that's probably what we killed moved it, out frankly. of that building and we had a little party and we had a party in that Millbank Tower on the 29th floor, something like that, quite near the top. 
and we were all binoculars looking at the Queen going by on the Thames because we were looking straight down over the Thames. Anyway, the building we moved to after that is called Bluefin and it's behind the Tate Modern Gallery, which is on the south side of the Thames, a bit further east. And so if you look, if you zoom in on um, the Thames and look for Tate Modern um, Gallery, the building just behind that, um, away from the river is is Bluefin, and that's where the name came from. That makes a whole lot of sense because I, I kept reading Ubuntuized on it, and I'm like, yeah, I, I need that. That's what I want. Um, it was avoiding <laughs> all trademarks wherever possible. Right, <laughs> like a clever boy. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, but I've been I've been on uh, Plasma because it 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 does a better job of multi DPI screens uh, than GNOME does. So Plasma does a better job of it. Uh, I had I had this issue when I was using Ubuntu. Uh, I guess it was the latest. It was twenty four oh four, I suppose, uh, where I was I had Wayland on. I'm, I'm on the framework laptop, which is some weird, uh, but I had to scale it at one fifty and uh, a ten eighty p screen at a hundred. And if I would take OBS and move it from one screen to the next screen, Wayland would crash. The entire desktop session would crash, and I'd have to log back in and start all the way over. Um, Plasma did not do that, though it had other weird scaling issues, but it didn't crash, and that was important. So, so I've been on Plasma for a little bit for that reason. Yeah, I had I had problems with moving Windows in pla in Plasma, where I would move it from a high DPI screen to a standard like 1080p screen, and as soon as I did that, the window was like whoop, suddenly grew yeah. ten times, and all the icons were like this big. This big yep. Face. So 5.28 and then now on to Plasma 6, I think, has solved that for me anyway. Uh, but now I just have one big old screen, so it makes uh, it, it makes a big difference. I mean, not having to re-log into your session and turn everything back on makes a big difference. Well, yeah, I can imagine. I've only ever had that issue when, like, everything freezes and nothing happens on Linux. No, I actually had that on Windows. It doesn't happen often. No, but once not or on twice I've had I've had it once or twice. It's just you know the whole system is just frozen, and I've I've can't for the life of me figure out why. Um, yeah, I don't think I've seen that on Windows or Mac recently. I mean, I've certainly seen it in the no. past, like long yeah, yeah. ago with dodgy drivers. But yeah, I was gonna say that's just Windows weirdness. Yeah, true. So, oh, that was um, my other. Uh, not fail of the week, but you know, I um, I was again uh, donating some stuff, and people would only take it if it had Windows on it, and so I had to try and get my. I had this um, tablet, PC type of thing, and um, it had Mint and Windows dual booting, so I thought, oh, it's okay. I'll just do the usual, just you know, uh, get rid of the Mint partition, and what I do normally. Except I didn't realize that this was an X Enterprise machine that had a BIOS password. <laughs> and, and so once I did that, it then just went into a grub menu and that was it. And so I then had to go around the faff of downloading the Windows media creation tool, flashing it onto USB and then redoing the whole thing. I mean, it did it in the end. Um, and it was less painless than Windows installs have been in the past. In Back in the day, basically you had to take a day out of your day. If you wanted to in install Windows 7 on your uh, on your computer, it was like, okay, that's the day gone. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So at least it's so, better than that, but it's still it's still not fun. I mentioned uh, Martin's project Quick Emu earlier. I've been playing around with it because uh, mm -hmm. I, I made a, a, a little program called Quick Test and, um, to do automated testing. And uh, Martin told me, oh, you know, Windows 10 and Windows 11 works fine in Quick Emu now. And I thought, oh, I'll give that a go. So I just ran Quick Emu, um, you know, to quick get, sorry, to get the ISO images for Windows 10 and Windows 11. And in parallel on my laptop, I had two copies of Quick Emu running, one installing Windows 10 and one installing Windows 11 at the same time. And it took no more than like 20 minutes, half an hour to, uh, from start to finish, automated all the way through. And I ended up with a fully installed Windows 10 and Windows 11. It was amazing. And I love yeah. it. And I now and, use Windows in a VM. And their new, uh, I was a WHQL, whatever that is. Um, they, they store a whole lot more drivers than they used to, and things tend to work better than they used to. But um, I've still got a sixth gen Intel system that I have to do that faff with, that I have to. Uh, and, and I'm just thankful that Asus still hosts those drivers because uh, I did the install last year 
and it took forever. The drivers are huge, and then you have to go through that process of next, 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 next. Yes, I do want audio. Next, 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 next. So, like, when I first started getting into IT, um, like back in the '90s when I was first had my first job, um, I worked at a company called Deloitte's, and we had a whole load of Dell laptops. And they had drivers, Windows drivers, Windows like three, and like the you know the, they were old, crusty versions of of Windows. Um, and Dell had a bulletin board that you could get the um, the drivers from, and you would dial up with a modem to Dell's bulletin board, their BBS, and then there was like a file list in the root directory with a list of every file that was in there, and all the files were eight dot three because it was all dos right eight characters dot three dot zip or whatever and a list of all the things and you had to go and search through all these file listings so you kids of today with yeah. the internet <laughs> and with your drivers are already installed thing. you know oh, that man. that actually brings up a that question is... because uh dell has this weird naming scheme for all of their drivers because they're they're self-extractable packages and they're like r and then a string of numbers or something is that where there they came go. from and then the yep, numbers just yep, got bigger as were. As like they sixteen always, they, bit. they already started with like eight characters and they were completely incomprehensible. It wasn't like you right, know, right. Uh, they still S are underscore Intel driver blah blah blah. They're yeah, just incomprehensible jumble of letters and numbers. Yeah, totally. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> Weird how so stuff sticks in your head. From. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm learning. I'm learning all this stuff about back in the day. I, I like am it. old. <laughs> <laughs> I I just have a don't thing worry. Bill is older. Yeah, mm. yeah. I have a uh, thing I for history though, that. man. I like I like I looking back and. Finding out where things came from and why they are the way they are, and they're, they're never really a good reason for any of that stuff, yeah. uh, other than you know arbitrary limitations of well they only had eight characters, you know. Yeah. So I, I love that kind of thing. I mean, just looking to the future, um, have have any of you guys um, noticed a lot more normies asking about Linux ever since um, this whole Copilot and um thing that you know microsoft unveiled a couple of weeks ago i've been getting random not random people but you know people who are slightly technologically minded not complete nerds and not complete noobs saying what's this linux thing then i, I, I don't like this whole ai and this that and the other I, I, is it just me or has anybody else had that conversation with anyone the maybe your peer group <clears throat> yeah i mean i haven't really heard that i mean most of the people i talk to are people like us so of course we yeah. already know a lot about the, it but yeah my, I, I'm, if my family I, I have a couple of younger people in my family i would expect them maybe to, to ask and no i haven't really because that whole recall things looks looks really spooky to me i think when they start changing the keyboard they start making copilot more sort of present and first party and in people's face i don't know that people are going to know what to do with it and I think that's when I'll start getting the questions. When my in-laws buy a new laptop. And yeah, but like, they won't be asking this? you how to remove it. They'll be asking you how to use it better. <laughs> uh, yes and no. Mm. Yes and so no. It, it seems like the split to me is the same split that you have with Linux folks, where it's like people that are in tune and have a, have a tinfoil hat on are the ones that are like, well, how do I remove this immediately? And how do I turn it off? And how do I get rid of it? I think and, what might happen is that as soon as they see what it is and they start using it and they believe that it's infallible for at least some period of time and then it bites them and they realize oh you have to verify the results at least for now maybe it gets better at some point um but you know in my own usage i've realized that i can't just on faith trust what it's telling me um i think that's probably what's going to happen is they're going to say well i was using it and it gave me something that ended up being the wrong information and is it unreliable or should i use it or shouldn't i use it and i guarantee you the first time they get burned by it it's going to become a much bigger deal um, I, I don't think so i think people will learn no? i think people yep. will i think they will learn to accept that you should consider all of these llms as um well i mean the name copilot is is really good because it is like sitting next to someone and you bouncing ideas off another human when yeah. you bounce an idea off another human, you don't immediately take their answer mm -hmm. and say, yes, that's right, I am going to go and buy a Subaru, right? You, you, you integrate that with knowledge you already have. Um, I think there are certainly um, 
less savvy people who believe every letter that comes through their front door and believe every phone call they have and you've seen those scam beta people who try and help people who get scammed online right there are certainly people who are not in possession of a lot of clue right and then there are more i think people in the middle ground who will just say hey this is quite cool it helped me with whatever task it was like yeah. and and yeah okay it might not be perfect but then like nothing is perfect nothing at all is perfect but no, i think so, you'd have so, to frame so, it that way yeah. i really do i, I, think no, I don't think to. they ever do i, I don't My, think any of the llms have ever said uh this will perfectly create a recipe for cakes or this will no, perfectly no, no. create. no but you're also you know, assuming that people do the in do the research to understand what an llm lm LLM no i i think is no, I don't think, I don't think any. To. I don't think anybody does, but no, I don't think anybody don't makes think that claim either. And anytime I ever talk to anybody about an LLM, I'm, I I remind them it's a computer, and computers are stupid. So you know, and that's that's how the conversation always goes. And the only people I see that are that are truly skeptical of it are the students that I deal with in the cybersecurity field, and the students that I deal with in any any other field are like, wait a minute, you're telling me I don't have to do you know six hours of research? I can do twenty minutes of research and reword some stuff and have the answer. I'm in. You know, like, and so, I don't know. I, I deal with a lot of people from a lot of different walks of life, and I don't see the people that are not security savvy, um, you know, going into full rejection mode on this. I think they're going to integrate it in. I think it's, I think, I think it's recall it. that was the one that people found. Yeah, take more... screenshots of your screen. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's okay. I'll, found out a bit. I'll, I'll give you the counterpoint. Recall is brilliant. It's a fantastic idea. It is. A genius and someone else already did it on the Mac and I made a version for Linux and so what it does is take a screenshot periodically mm -hmm. and uh, does OCR on the screenshot and stores that in a database why would you want to do that because our memories are fallible and I can't remember the name of the website that I looked at last week I don't use a lot of bookmarks and I don't remember the name of the document that I was working on with someone. I can't remember the title of it. I may remember a couple of words that were on the screen right. or something. And so having an assistant that can just hoover up everything that's on my screen, putting aside all the things about passwords and, you know, filtering out stuff that you don't want it to, the very idea that there could be a database that knows all the things I looked at and worked on, I think it would help me because I have a terrible memory. And I, I would love that. The bit about it being Microsoft, I think, is the thing exactly that's making people uncomfortable. And then also the fact that in the same sentence as we're taking screenshots of all your stuff, there is AI, LLMs, machine learning. Right. And then people just immediately think, well, Microsoft is just going to send all that to their cloud and they're going to have a copy of everything that's ever been on your screen. And it rings alarm bells, much like the old um amazon shopping thing did on ubuntu a decade ago like, exactly it's the same kind of people too um oh no I, the same i'm kind not, of people I'm, not a, I'm not a tinfoil hat i'm really not i i like new technology that make, especially new technology hold on, hold on. the tinfoil money. hat's coming down right now bill in the video make sure you put one on whenever he's saying this <laughs> um never mind i forgot sorry I <laughs> sorry i didn't mean to totally ruin and derail you <laughs> So you're reluctant, Eric. You're you're you wouldn't use it. Um, no, I, I like technology that makes my life easier, uh, and I will. I'm willing to make the trade off. But for a company like Google, like Microsoft, for the 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 big tech companies, I do not trust them to be good you know, good stewards of my information. Mm -hmm. So when I can run AI completely detached from the cloud on my own system yep, yep, yep. using whatever combination of chips and technologies that that needs to, to support it then i'm all in but mm -hmm. as but if for as long as i need to be continually sending my data to a cloud where they say well we don't keep it we are we anonymize it there's no way for anyone to ever know that it was you satya said it was Bullshit. gonna be only <laughs> local man only right. local do you well, trust so, um mozilla with something like that or is it just mm, no not it's about really. track record as well, though, isn't it? It's about track record. I mean, you know, big tech has a track record of, well, bullshitting, basically. Yeah. Well, what, you know what's going to happen, though? What, what's I mean, going to happen, though? The concept of an LLM is, is, is taking data that isn't theirs. 
I mean, it's well, the entire um, underpinning of how it works. For some of them, yes, and for the the popular ones, yes, yes. Yeah, is. I think okay. I think I, what Mozilla is trying to do is is do not that. I mean, less yeah. of that at least. The yeah. the llama one, the the ones that you can download and use fully offline, they're the ones that Mozilla curate are pretty neat. They're they're obviously not as powerful and not as clever and not quite as accurate. You know, probably because they don't have all the all of the data of humankind that has been stolen and right. injected into the model. They don't have all the Linux OTCs integrated in them, so they don't have the or, best vocabulary. Or all I'll of get the, right on that. All, all of the articles that have ever been published on the Onion, for example, yeah. and yeah. all of Reddit. And, oh uh, God, and that. that's why we have glue pizza, okay? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> because it is ingested Reddit, and man, half of Reddit is just written in sarcasm. So he. Yeah, yeah, like every I, answer I, I, should I, I, have a slash s at the end of it, <laughs> right? So yeah, I, I I made a Linux version that just took screenshots and used a free piece of software called Tesseract, which can mm -hmm. find all the words on your screen. I mean, yep. it's mainly used for for doing OCR of documents, but you could just give it a screenshot and it will find all the words on your screen and then just stuff them in a database. But as soon as this recall thing came out, I thought, do you know what? I can't, I can't share this because people will just pounce on it, and I'll be tainted by the same f sentiment that people have for Microsoft. And plus, the fact that I worked at Canonical, people would be like, "Oh, it's that guy." Again. Oh, uh, so you know, yeah. he was involved I, I, in the Amazon scandal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I, I told you it was spyware. I told you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's spyware. So I think evaluating your own, the importance of something like that for you, because you're saying you don't have a particularly great memory and the utility of that. And let's say also that maybe that's on your work system, mm -hmm. right? Where you specifically need it to be a tool for you to accomplish something or remember something that is work related. My problem is that, you know, I'm doing everything on a laptop that I don't, know what's going to be appropriate for the system to grab and not grab so the ability to filter what it's capturing even if that exists and is is a you're able to to tell it the amount of overhead and administration that it takes to do that i mean i'm thinking of my now, pie the, hole the think of, um, think of the amount of effort that goes into just trying to filter internet traffic and like you don't know what you don't know and there's so much mm. You know but I mean? in, an, in an enterprise, though, the amount of administration and the overhead is actually going to be none because what they'll do is they'll use group policy to turn it off and it will be off. Mm. Like when, when you're working in the medical field under, you know, all the HIPAA regulation and stuff like that, there's no way in hell that HIPAA is going to be like, yeah, go ahead. That'll be a feature that you can use on every medical yeah. machine ever. No, it will be mandated to be turned off and the admins will turn it off. It's interesting because if you did have it turned on and it had really good filters and it would look at the you know, the window title and say, ah, oh, well, now he's got uh, this particular application open and we don't want to record things mm. in that particular application. That's finance Bit application, wooden. for example. Or, or Bitwarden, right? But what if I'm on a Zoom call with a colleague and they share their screen and inside their screen oh. they share that window? How would my screenshot thing know mm. that? Because it would look at the window title and see Zoom. It wouldn't see Bitwarden because mm -hmm. it would just see a picture inside of a Zoom window. And so it, I'm, I'm certain you're right, Eric, that it, it would be so hard to be very accurate and very precise yeah. about i don't want this thing and i do want that other thing over there and how does it tell the difference it's hard yeah and so you've built that tool for yourself that data is never going to go anywhere it is only for your local use uh, yeah. for unless your, i'm completely incompetent and i ftp it up to a server somewhere yeah <laughs> right so in that case really then it's more about consent because if you're worried that if you happen to be in a zoom meeting and you see something on there that maybe that system that person wouldn't have expected someone to capture mm. um, although i would contend that zoom is almost like a public space where you should just expect you know that surveillance is possible um, I don't, it, it just opens up a whole different set of, and, and I guess the other thing is that Microsoft tends to just push forward with things in a seemingly very bullish way where it's like, we now are going to put a co-pilot button on every piece of hardware we sell with has windows on it. Like that's, seems so what like is a Linux small... going to do with that button? That's the real question. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But one, one of the things that I think Microsoft is, is going to get away with 
on this is that they do say that it's all going to be localized. And let's say that you do trust their word on that. What's going to happen is that people are going to find out how to link that particular directory or, or whatever it is where all those images are stored and then hook that up to OneDrive. And then those are all going to get sucked up into the cloud. And then there's going to be this huge scandal of how Microsoft is hoovering up all of your data. And then I'll look at all these images that they have on the cloud. It's on the cloud. We told you it was going to be on the cloud. And then six months later, after it was all taken apart, you're going to realize that it was someone that, that shared that directory. But, you know, the damage will already have been done. The, 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 the report. Well, surely the they can articles. see that then. Well, surely they can see that coming then. And they would have. You would think they would put some safeguards in you for their own sake, think. not for our sake, not for our sake, but for their own sake. Right, but I, I would imagine project. that they'll allow you to share any directory you want, and if that if if the recall directory is just a directory, then you should be able to just back that up. I think it's interesting that some companies create a thing, honestly thinking that it is a useful feature, like they genuinely believe in their heart of hearts. That this thing is a useful feature that will be a time saver or will make it easier for people to you know, recall um, events and uh, documents and what music was I listening to when I was looking at that website or you know whatever it might Seriously, be. Seriously, I've had that question so many times. Right, and I, I think sometimes they might overlook the the repercussions of stuff and i know we did at canonical when the amazon shopping lens came out like some of us were like this is a disaster we should not be doing this and other people were like well no i think it'd be okay and you you don't know until it's out there and then once it's out there and everyone freaks out and goes nuts and <laughs> says this is bad you you didn't think about these use cases and you're like oh oh yeah Mm, that's all cool. I think developers are naturally curious people. They're very creative people. They like to solve problems. They like to break new ground and do things. And I don't think that very many of them ever do things in a nefarious way, like they're trying to be harmful. I think they just tend to do things that have unintended consequences that other people can then exploit. And that is really the danger, unfortunately, of something like this uh, this technology where you know, there, it's a very robust surveillance tool. You know, if, uh, if someone is trying to extract information from you and, and is trying to blackmail you, is trying to, you know, a government agency is trying to surveil you. I mean, whatever the case is, like, that's a very robust way to do it. Mm. Um, unintended, but there you go. Yeah. And I think, so that's kind of the way I think of it is, and, and also the acceptance of it, because as soon as someone says, you know, there's going to be a Good Morning America story on this about how Windows now has this great new features and, and how it saved me so much time. Because like you said, last week I was doing something and I couldn't remember what it was. And, you know, it would have taken me hours to figure it out. And it took me five minutes. And that's then going to popularize it. And so, and then once it's out, it's out. And then that's just becomes the new state of the art. And, and um, you know, and I know there's no real way to stop the progress of technology. But we have the I best tracking wish. device and oh, surveillance device right here. We, the recall is, yes, it will make it easier, but it's yeah. not going to change the landscape like GPS in your phone did. I think yeah. it gives you it gives a, a little more context and content to what's actually there. It. it I mean, I already think that the law enforcement has gotten very lazy. Like the first thing they do is get your phone and then, you know, where were you? What were you doing? Who were you texting? Like yeah. if they didn't have that, a lot of times it's like, oh, wait a minute. I have to go and actually like. No, they would just call AT&T and, and ask them to try and get your position <laughs> via the towers yeah. that you were connected to at the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I think technology is already made. And, and listen, I have no reason to distrust authority in terms of like my day to day life. But I also see do you hear that, that AI LLMs? Listen, yeah, exactly. He's, but but I also a good guy. realize that you know it's not about me necessarily. It's about what becomes normal, and mm. the fact that you know these technologies. Nobody is there's literally zero oversight. Companies have complete carte blanche to do whatever they want, whenever they want, and the only real recourse is whether their customers or even better, their shareholders have a problem with it. I think there's also, I think you make a good point, but I think there's also people push back on this stuff. Like, um, 
You know those robot taxis that you have in the States where they drive around and pick people up? The ones that have no driver, or it's a remote driver or something. And people have figured out that if you put a traffic cone on the bonnet, uh, you know, on the front of the car, or if you wear a T-shirt that has a picture of a stop sign, you can subvert these stupid cars because they're trying to pattern match, right? I wouldn't be surprised if people figured out that, you know, if you put pixels like a grid of pixels on your screen overlaid that it completely defeats the, you know, the recall thing. Mm -hmm. If you put a gray mesh of, you know, triangles on your screen, you can see through it, but the computer is like, oh my God, all I can see is triangles and it can't find any text. You know, there'll be people who who defeat this stuff, um, I'm I'm sure. And people are very creative at, at, uh, you know, undoing the 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 stuff big tech does i think like well like you said pie hole is a great example of that it's like no i don't want all your advertising i don't want all your tracking cookies i don't want my bandwidth to be taken up downloading humongous videos that you've embedded in your page here's a little thing that runs on a computer that cost me less than 50 bucks and uh, i don't have to suffer with all that horse shit that you're sending down the cable to my computer. Um, I think people will push back on that kind of stuff. How long does it take to actually set up a pie hole, do you reckon? It's like five minutes. I, yeah, it's no time at all. It's you, you, the Raspberry Pi imager software that you can get from the Raspberry Pi website. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just put an SD card in your computer, download the Raspberry Pi imager. You pick what operating system you want, and one of them yeah. has got pie hole. And you just press a button, it puts it on the SD card. You put the SD card in the Raspberry Pi and tell your machines to use DNS from the Raspberry Pi. Basically, that's yeah. it. Yeah, it would, it would take longer to set up your router to point to the Pi hole as the DNS yeah. provider than it would to actually get the Raspberry Pi Pi hole set up. And I dare and, not do that because then my wife's stupid little phone games won't work. <laughs> <laughs> They will. They'll just yeah. have that floating X with no ad, and then yeah, she'll she not be able to, to push watch it. the ad, so she gets. Yeah, but you could <laughs> you could have an allow list just for her device. Oh God! Like, so I'm not going to sit there and allow the list address. all that crap. <laughs> no, no, I mean just allow list her IP address, her Mac address. Oh, yeah, so uh, that, yeah, that's so true. That everyone else gets the benefit of the hard work you've put in putting pie hole pie hole in, and if she wants to sit and watch a 10 minute advert so she can get more coins in a stupid game, then that's up to her. She's got her phone so banjacked from all that, too. <laughs> she could be doing anything, and some stupid web web page will pop up right in her face. But I guess that's an acceptable. That's an acceptable thing. That's how we pay for the internet. Oh, okay. This is what Eric was saying. There are people who honestly yeah. believe they're doing the right thing. These people are maximizing shareholder value for the game developer and taking home a salary at the same time and keeping your wife entertained while you're podcasting or (laughs) trucking or whatever it is you're doing. You just have to accept a small amount. And I do. I fight the fight that, well, that I can win. Yeah. Speaking of fighting the fight, yes, Bill, I did finish Shogun. Ah, Shogun, yeah. Yeah. It was Uh, good. What did you think of the last... The last episode, I thought. I like the spoilers. Kind of yeah, I know. Try not to, yeah, try not to give away too many spoilers. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I mean the bit when Captain America turned up was brilliant. Oh, yeah. I thought. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I thought that that that, was, that, that, that was a little surprising. surprising. I yeah, now they're they're just even, throwing random you know, stuff we, in there. We, now. we didn't we know he spoke Japanese. <laughs> yeah, man. Seriously, did Batman you know, show up too? Yeah, 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 yeah there's a lot of crossover stuff nowadays, so it's kind of hard to be. Yeah, and then the Mandalorian just flies in. Ah. No, no, but you're, you're welcome to discuss. It. You're welcome to discuss in generalities. Just don't be specific. That's all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I do want to watch <laughs> so the third episode of I Love Lucy, right? <laughs> I love Lucy. Is that the one where she's working on the assembly line and the chocolate? Actually, it is pretty things? early on. Yeah, that one is good. That's the stuff I grew up on. Yeah, I, I was watching. Nice. By the, I was watching Baby Reindeer, um, and then it started getting really dark, like about halfway through, and then I thought. Actually, I don't want to watch this now. This this isn't the light, fun Scottish comedy I thought it was. Do we you know? have to shock people in order to entertain them nowadays, or is that just what? They, no, it's they, not about that. That's I mean, just you, I Bill. Yeah. Oh, is that what it, no, okay. no. I mean, I, the, the reason it gets dark is because it, you know, it's. Um, I believe it's a bit of catharsis for the writer because it's autobiographical. 
what um, happened. And I think it's a lot of it is about him because he's a comedian, but you know, he, he went through some shit basically. And so it comes across initially as very funny and witty because it is, he's a funny and witty guy. Unfortunately, his story is a bit dark. And so therefore, if you get, uh, I mean, and, and that's fine. You know, that's fine if you, that's what you want to watch. And it is very well made and well acted and stuff like that. But me and my wife wanted to just watch some, kind of comedy you know switch your brain off type of popcorn stuff do you know what i mean like brooklyn 99 something like that you know um and it wasn't that so that's why we stopped no it very much isn't that <laughs> it very much isn't that um, well, comedians are generally at least the good ones are broken people like yeah. profoundly broken it people. seems like <laughs> it seems like to well, get I the mean, funny that, bone that, you have I mean, to be that, a little that, busted. i mean that was actually the premise of a um an indian film which said that, you know, you can only make good art if you've been through, you know, in a turmoil or whatever. And you've got this guitarist who's trying to make it big. And that's what his producer says. You've not been through anything. You've not been through any shit. You've had a nice life. You're never going to make yeah. good music, you know. And then his life does turn to shit. And then he starts <laughs> becoming a massive rock star. And then he's like, I don't want this now. I don't want it. I don't want it. Right. Take it back. And we wonder why they all die of overdoses. Yeah. Let me step so, back just one second. So if I've looked at, at Shogun like... Every time I open the app, it keeps showing it to me. And I have yet to sort of jump into it, and I'm not entirely sure why. So tell me why you think it was worth watching if you did watch oh, the whole thing. And For starters, it, you cannot put this show on and then just let it play as background noise because it's entirely subtitled. Well, I can't do that anyway. I, I have never been that type of person yeah. that can like put a movie or a video on and then not pay attention to it. So all right, well that's you'll do you'll do well with this. I, I mean, there is some English speaking people in the story, but by and large, most of the dialogue is subtitled. In, in wait, wait, so that. is it Japanese? It's Japanese. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's live action anime. Wow. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's not so much the. There is a little bit of martial arts and violence in it and that but it's it's mostly a story of uh 17th century feudal japan uh, yeah japan yeah so and, i mean it's i mean it's it's historical it's a period of history that most people don't know a huge amount about i'm a history buff you know uh, and i didn't know much about i it. am too and i had no idea that christianity yeah. had such a huge presence and yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I mean, I knew it got banned, and I knew that mm -hmm. you know that you know it was excluded and all that, but you know the period before that, you know, and the circumstances around the banning, as we were, of Christianity and the closing off of Japan, because that's what this period is, isn't it? Um, so I think, yeah, so you know, it's a window into a world that many of us don't know. And so that's always that's always interesting and exciting to see something different. Because I mean, how many times have we seen Tudors and Victorians and do you know what I mean? Medi yeah. Even medieval things are quite you know it's not it doesn't have any of the kind of wow factor. Then there's the fact that Japanese culture is so very different to Western culture, I suppose, in a sense. And you see that real kind of. Um, clash of uh i want to say clash of civilizations because that's going a bit too far but you know that kind of where the cultures don't can't understand each other's language and not literally literally they can't understand each other's languages because one you know they're speaking japanese but then even when they can understand the language they don't understand you know the their way of thinking of like w why does this person need to die or because he lied but why it's just a little thing yeah but you know your man do you see yeah. what i mean and well, so i think um the uh, uh and then the storyline fits in with that because, yeah, it's, it's like your standard thing with lots of twists and turns and this. But, you know, it's, again, very rooted in that idea of um, Japanese culture and things like that. You know, it, none of it seems incongruous, if you know what I mean. Have any of you guys seen the, like, 50s and 60s uh, samurai movies like Seven Samurai, Throne of Blood, Samurai Rebellion, like all of those classic? Yeah. Uh, Yojimbo, like... There was Does an it old give you sort of uh, any Shogun shades of that, or? you know, you you feel like, especially movies that that lean on the subtitling quite a bit, you feel like there is some uh, influence from some of those movies because that that mean 
that was a cult kind of following stuff like that you know we we still enjoy that was, kind of stuff it was a revelation i didn't discover them till about 10 years ago and oh. I, I kind of i once i found the seven samurai it was like oh okay this is a thing i have to go back and find all these and, and watch and they, them and they leaned on the yeah. dubbed in uh audio in those days and it was just awful mm. but that kind of <laughs> that kind of added to the experience they're so good yeah. at that nowadays um what was that one movie they did that crouching tiger hidden dragon yeah they they dubbed that in and it and it really i don't know how they made was it the first one or the second or am i just completely off with that i'm, I'm sure it was subtitled wasn't it i, I remember watching it as a, as a subtitle crouching tiger hidden dragon okay but but there's been quite a few i remember hero was a good one um that might be what i'm thinking of yeah yeah jet lee the hero yeah the jet lee one yeah, that the, the so maybe it's something, but yeah, no, but I know they got made... really good with the with the dubbing and the the audio. It almost they figured out a way to make it line up with the lip a little bit better, or maybe I don't know. Maybe my brain is just it's probably AI. It's yeah, that's what it is, isn't it? <laughs> it absolutely is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so um, I'm now going to start. Having said that, you know, uh, medieval stuff is blasé. I'm now starting to watch Shard Lake on Disney. Which is like a detective thing, but set in Tudor England. Mm. So um, you know, um, I'm, I'm I've just started that. Um, I was also thinking of starting uh, Dark Matter. Uh, I think it's an Apple TV thing. It's supposed to be good. I don't know if anybody. Wait a minute, hold on, it. Bill. I need you to go off on the Apple TV. Thing. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> Make sure you buy an Apple TV <laughs> device, or else you'll you only can just get, get a Roku. God. You'll only get the first yeah. three episodes. Well, I mean, some people might use a bit torrent, but I mean, you know, I would obviously never advocate anything of that sort. I'm glad you didn't look dead at me when I you said that. I don't have any <laughs> Apple devices, but I've actually heard the Apple TV is a pretty good streaming device, just full stop on its own. Yeah. 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 Don't know. No, I've never mean, tried it. My son's got one, and it works great. And actually, it, I've got an NVIDIA Shield, and the way they've kind of, come look at this or come buy this kind of stuff into the ui it's a little irritating and then the app but the apple product they don't do that well because roku they don't need is, to. well you pay for it <laughs> yeah you pay to not roku's, have that roku's like square into that in shitification phase right yeah. now so i'm uh, trying yeah, to they think of are. like i mean they're still it's still usable but i have a feeling that within a year or two it's probably going to be pretty insufferable yeah, but any device like that that you pay nine ninety nine for on sale, they're gonna follow that eventually. Yeah, true. I mean, I've got an Amazon Fire Stick, and I've yeah. also got a Chromecast. Those came in shitified, so you know. Yeah. yeah. And to be honest, it, it work. It works fine. It's not great, but then, uh, to be honest, I'm I I prefer I prefer the Chromecast. I, I I got into that quite early on when they first came out back in twenty thirteen, and so I've you know i'm used to that i quite like that i like the idea of, of streaming something from a device like i agree with you i yeah. don't need all the heavy you know the device itself has to be pretty powerful like the roku you know i got just got the like top end one because it was so slow as the stick I mean, mm -hmm. it was just because it overheats you know it's just too much for this little tiny you know device to to try to you know do the encoding and like all this stuff at one time mm -hmm. and it's you know barely enough memory so i got the best one and it's still not particularly performant and so i'm thinking you know what are my alternatives and you know shield was an idea and but i keep coming back to like apple tv actually seems like it's a pretty solid device even though you'll, you'll end up there eventually you'll spend a little bit of money on some other devices but then you'll get there yeah i've got well, definitely not getting a smart tv that's for sure so i've got a disaster uh, before we started recording, I put some rice in the rice cooker. Whoops. It's still in there, downstairs, <laughs> an hour well, later. Oops. So that was episode 30. Thanks, everybody, for listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? You, it, it is a good time to wrap it up, and we, we're we never very good at figuring out how no, to do that's, that. That's a, a nice, good neat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the rice is burning. The rice no! is burning. Yeah, if there would have been smoke... Name of the, that's the title. That's the title, Nate. Yes, that's the title. We got <laughs> it. <laughs> the rice is burning. <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, let us know what you think of any of this stuff. I don't know. I don't even remember what we talked about. Um, yeah. <laughs> stuff. Oh, hey, we actually at, talked uh, about Linux this time. For like we did. The first time we did. Thank while, you very much. So. Yeah. Um, show at 
linuxotc.org. Comment directly on the website, whatever you want to do. We're out there. <laughs> we'll be You'll back in a couple out. weeks. Yeah, just figure it out. You guys are nerds. You can figure it out. Yeah, seriously. got to hold your yeah. hand. Yeah, you just ask open AI. <laughs> <laughs> look, uh, look us up on chat, Dippity. Chat we'll see you in a couple weeks, folks. Till then, I've been Bill. I've been Eric. I've been Majid. I'm still Leo. And I've got to go and make some more rice. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, folks. Later.